Yeah, up with sterile technique, and you have towels, and you're putting the chest tube, and you see a big gush of blood, and the tube's on the side of the chest. Or somebody advancing on the chest tube. <coughs> Someone's suturing the chest tube. Here's your anatomy. I think I create a bank. Make sure you want to turn something to ZJ, his biceps, his triceps, or we'll, we'll everywhere. Okay? Thoracic cavity is defined anterior by the sternum. Thoracic vertebrae posteriorly, the ribs, ladder, and the diaphragm is your gene here at Okay? The chest wall is composed of the ribs, the sternum, the thoracic vertebrae, and the intercostal muscles. The diaphragm is the floor of the cavity. Okay? Plural anatomy. Remember the plural of viral? Viral plural. I can't say today. Only two membranes are separated by a small amount of fluid called plural fluid. It kind of lubricates when you get pleurisies when they kind of catch and kind of come together. It reduces friction. So, why is this picture important? Or talk about placed in chest tube. Because you go right the Correct. Because the last thing you want to do is place a chest tube on the inferior surface of the rib because you get into the neurovascular bundle, get into the nerve artery in the vein, you can cause an intercostal vessel bleed, and that can make them have to go to surgery. Okay? Um, so you always want to go on the superior surface of the rib. My fingers are the ribs, you want the superior surface. Okay? Water under the bridge. Exactly. Oh. Exactly. Okay? Coral anatomy lungs surrounded by what we call the the, the visceral pleura, okay, the membrane folds over itself, you have the parietal pleura lines the chest wall, the visceral pleura covers the lungs, someone calls the pulmonary pleura. So, if air fluid enters the pleural space between the parietal and visceral pleura, that minus four centimeters of mercury is disrupted, okay? Well, what happens is the lung collapses and the lung cannot re-expand until you put in a chest tube and suck that air out where the lung can expand, okay? I kind of tell people, it's kind of like, think of a balloon inside of a balloon, okay? And, and so what happens is this pressure exists, and when there's a, a puncture in that outer balloon, air leaks in, and that inner balloon can't expand. Does that make sense? So absolute indications for chest tubes, obviously large pneumothorax, moderate large pneumothorax, hemothorax, pleural effusions, um, a chylothorax, you know what a chylothorax is? Thoracic duct. get injured, sometimes you do a subclaving at the end of that thoracic duct, and have chyle in there. Okay. So it's a complication of a of a subclavian, left subclavian deal, or from trauma. So, you know, if you have a big hemothorax and you don't evacuate, it can turn into a big infection, a big hyema, empyema, okay? It'll turn into like a big horse rind or kind of, a, kind of an orange rind, real hard, and it gets, looks like an orange peel on the outside of the lung. Relative indications, so obviously somebody has a pneumothorax that you're going to put on a ventilator. Okay, so people with rib fractures and positive, put on positive pressure ventilation can get a tension pneumothorax. Okay? People who are profoundly hypoxic, hypotension, penetrating chest trauma. Okay? What are the, y'all know what the signs and symptoms of a tension pneumothorax are? Hypotension. Okay? Air hunger. Okay? Hypotension, hypoxia, tracheal deviation. So anybody, you know, obviously somebody has a gunshot wound to the chest and they have penetrating trauma and they're, they're hunger, tension in the thorax. You wait for a chest x-ray? No. No, exactly. I have a little diagram to, to show what it looks like when the air is in the space, called the pneumothorax, okay? <laughs> pneumothorax is air, hemothorax is blood, you can have a hemopneumothorax, the blood and air in the chest, okay? Causes of pneumothorax and trauma, obviously penetrating trauma, which we talked about the other day, can be gunshot wounds, stab wounds, impalement, okay? Barrel trauma is something else, scuba divers, okay? Uh, blast injuries type stuff, okay? Fall. Uh, people with underlying lung disease, people with COPD ears, okay? People with TB, cystic fibrosis, okay? Those people can get, you know, a lot of blebs, okay? That, that rupture, you know what a bleb is, if you see blebs in your chest x-ray, right? Okay? And iatrogenic, okay? That means it's caused, okay? You know, the lung biopsy or chest surgery or, you know, attempted central line placement and you poke it in the middle of the pleura and drop the lung. Iatrogenic, okay? The people that get the typical spontaneous pneumos are, you know, the kind of the, you know, the board questions are the skinny trombone player, kind of a skinny guy, you know? Uh, tall, skinny kind of people. Those people a lot of times get spontaneous pneumothoraces. Uh, when you talk about a pneumothorax, you can classify those, are they open or closed, okay? Uh, and open, you get well, obviously with penetrate the trauma. Close is you have a puncture in the pleura from a rib fracture, okay? Or from uh, some type of, you know, obviously it can also be kind of like a, a spontaneous pneumo, but mainly when you talk about traumatic pneumothorax, it's open or close. Tension pneumothorax. Do you understand how it happens? You get a little ball valve mechanism, what happens? You inspire, air comes into the chest cavity, and that little flap closes back up, 
and you and all you're doing is stacking the air and you're stacking breaths. Okay? And so what's what's so crazy about attention pneumothorax is what happens is why do these people crump? Why do they get hypotensive? Because uh, it compresses the IBC. Exactly, because all that pressure in that chest wall is impeding cardiac output, is impeding you know venous return, and, and uh, it, it's pretty pretty awful and pretty quick. You know, if you happen to see a chest X-ray and someone with attention pneumothorax, I mean, you know, you're about crapping your pants. Like, oh gosh, you know, you can't get to the patient fast enough to alleviate it. Uh, it's crazy. So symptoms with pneumothorax can be very minimal. Okay, uh, you can have very very aches a little bit, hurts a little bit, and feel a little bit short of breath. Be very dyspneic. Okay. Have pleuritic type pain, sharp kind of pain, we call pleuritic pain. Um, be sensitive in bending, doing sudden onset. It's typically occurred with attention or spontaneous. What are some things we'll see with a physical exam? It may make you think of having pneumothorax on a physical exam. Okay, decreased breast sounds. Okay, asymmetric chest expansion, deviated trachea, diminished breast sounds, hyperresonance. Those crazy things they teach you in school to decrease tactile firmness. Just die. Okay. How to diagnose a pneumothorax? Obviously, it's chest X-ray. Okay. If you have an unstable patient who you think has attention pneumothorax, you need to do compress. Okay. So, how do we image pneumothoraces? Obviously, chest X-ray is the most common. Chest X-ray and CT. Okay. One of the things you also want to tell them to do when you get the chest X-ray is take deep breath in and expand. Okay, you want to get the lungs and diaphragm kind of expanded, where you can get a little better picture. Okay, so it's really hard seeing pneumothoraces sometimes that are that are very small on people. I mean, obviously, it's very subtle. It's it's not subtle here. You see all the little light, tiny streaks? These are lung markings. Okay, it's pretty easy to see here. This is really dense and dark, and pretty easy to see that that lung is down. Okay, sometimes you'll have very, very, very subtle little. Little tiny, little tiny thin line right up here at the apex, or sometimes a little, a little tiny that is very, very vague and hard to see. Chest CT obviously is easy, okay? Easy to see the orthorax on CT. So, what do we do for, for pneumothoraces? If it's, it's all depending on the setting, okay? And what's wrong with the patient, okay? With somebody that, hey, I fell, I cracked a rib, or the only injury is a little pneumothorax, you know, uh, and it's small. You know, sometimes you can watch those. You can get repeat x-rays, you can get one in a couple hours, you can get 12 back hours, you can come back the next day for a repeat. People are really kind of really asymptomatic. Sometimes you can manage these small pneumothoraces as an outpatient. You just have to be very, very careful. Kind of like we talked about the intoxicated patients with patients under the influence. Are they reliable? Okay, do they have enough wits in their head to think it's worse to come back? Okay? Um, you're never going to get sued for putting a chest tube in a patient with a pneumothorax. Okay? You are going to get sued if you have a patient with a pneumothorax, you go home and have a complication, okay, and have a bad outcome, okay? So, you know, whether we put a chest tube in them, you know, it's one of those deals, it's really kind of, just depends. You know, radiologists will, will say this when they read an x-ray, well, it's a 10% pneumo, or it's a 20% pneumo. It's kind of like that 20 feet or 30 feet. It's a guesstimation, okay? So, you know, they use kind of 10 to 20% of what you'll see on a radiologist on their on their x-ray report, what they feel is kind of a small pneumothorax, okay? Um, spontaneous pneumos, you know, again, we talked about some of these small ones, people who in the setting really have no significant traumatic injuries. Obviously, if you have a patient who has a small pneumothorax and they're going to be on the ventilator, they're going to go to surgery, they, they need a chest tube, okay? Mm -hmm. You can see lung markings here. <coughs> see, you can see the lung little streets all the way out to here, and then from here down to not. And kind of the same at the top. So that's, that's a, you know, small or moderate size pneumothorax. Okay. Um, one of the things I think is sometimes helpful. Have y'all got the mess with digital X-ray? Have y'all actually seen the X-ray machine? There's a couple. There's a couple trouble tricks on the digital X-rays. You know, pretty much everybody's digital now. You have the abilities called inverting the images that makes the dark light and the, and the light dark, and it really pops and it really makes it easier to look for a pneumothorax. Anytime I'm looking for a suspecting pneumothorax, I can really look at chest X-ray. Before I'm done, I'll invert the image. It really kind of makes it easier. And another thing, if you're looking for rib fractures, another thing that's kind of cool that makes it kind of easier to, to look at the ribs and stand out is literally, is, is spin the, spin the x-ray upside down. You know, where you're kind of looking, you're focusing more on the ribs if you're looking for rib fractures. So those are kind of a couple of tricks that I think really help you when you're looking at rib fractures or you're looking for pneumothorax. So obviously it's pretty easy to say. I mean, the whole lung is down, it's black, it's dark. I mean, these, these are, these are x-rays that you're not going to miss, okay? But 
anytime you get a chest x-ray for any reason, okay? <coughs> if you get a shoulder x-ray and there's part of the lung, you got to look. Even if you're not suspecting pneumothorax, even, you know, hey, they got, you know, I've had a cough, I've had bronchitis, whatever. If you shoot a chest x-ray, you want to always look for a pneumothorax. Just because it's not the reason you're looking, you always want to look systematically to make sure you don't miss anything, okay? Sometimes these people will have very subtle findings. So, and these, and these, these apples are, are really tough sometimes because this little line right here, sometimes it'll follow the line of the rib, okay? So sometimes it's very difficult, sometimes to look and even find, there's a little, you see a little space between here and there. So some of these apical pneumos are, are really, really hard to tell. But sometimes you all see is the apex, okay? Air rises, right? So, so a lot of times you see apical pneumos, but sometimes you may see down at the bottom of the base as well. It's a little easier to see. As you see, they can sometimes follow the shadow of the ribs. So it's really easy when you're looking at things and look for stuff to overlook these. See how black that black area? I mean, it's pretty easy. I mean, obviously, it's simple and easy as pie to see a pneumothorax on a chest CT. Okay, what image is that? What what plane is that? Those are axial. Okay. So I sent this way. Okay, those are axial images. And what window is that? That's a lung window. Okay. That's a lung window. When I talk about, you can invert your images. You can do an abdomen. You can do a bone window, you can do a lung window, you can change the settings and the color of things. That's a lung, the lung window. You see all the whiteness in the lung, and the whiteness of the soft tissue. So closed pneumothorax. Chest wall is intact, you have rupture of the lung, the visceral pleura, or airway allows air into the pleural space, and lung collapses. Okay? At a closed pneumothorax, a patient who's breathing spontaneous can have equilibration pressure that cause the collapse lung. Again, these patients have minimal symptoms, okay? The moderate symptoms. It really just depends. What, what kind of pneumothorax is this? An open pneumothorax, right? <laughs> this guy. His wife told him to have dinner on the table and he didn't listen. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So opening the chest wall with or without lung puncture allows atmospheric air into the pearl space. Penetrating trauma, stabbing, gunshot, impelment, surgery. Okay? An open pneumothorax is always called a sucking chest wound, a sucking gunshot wound, or a chest wound. <laughs> With the pressure changes to the chest, it only occurs with breathing, air moves out of the chest wall and open the chest wall. You know, when you see somebody with, with a penetrating chest trauma, it's going to gurgle. Boom, 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 sounds almost kind of weird. And you're like, why are they blowing bubbles out of their chest? Kind of crazy. Okay? Here's a guy who has a gunshot wound to the chest. That little chest mark that we talked about the other day, it's kind of right there. That just marks the hole where the hole was in the chest. So if somebody comes in with a chest wound, okay, an open chest wound, what do we want to do with that chest wound? We want to put stitches in it? No. What do we want to do? Huh? What did you say? Don't close it. Don't close it. What do we want to do? We want to put a dressing on it? What kind of dressing do we want to put on it? You can put an occlusive dressing okay, on it. Okay. You can put a chest seal on it. Right. Okay. Y'all remember the thing that was taught all about the flap about having, a, having an occlusive deal and, and tape it on three sides where essentially when you suck you inhale It'll compress where air can't come in. We exhale, keep pinch tension to the air can come out, right? So it depends on where you have. I mean, you're out in the wilderness, you know. If you got your, you know, rice repeat treat, but that little package and some tape, you know, you can get you can use whatever works, right? Okay. This is kind of concept we talked about, you know, kind of the older days of how we seal. Okay. You have the collapse lung. The expiration allows the trapped air to escape through the section of the dressing and some tape. Get the concept? Okay. This is something that's kind of old, but not really used much more. This is called an Asherman chest seal. A little something you can put over it. Again, it's a little flapper, a little one-way valve. Okay? <laughs> the kind of new thing that's up with society and trends today, um, a, lot of, a lot of our management of, of active shooters, chest trauma, stuff is really coming from the military and tackle combat casualty care. They're really kind of setting the standard for how we take care of these trauma patients. Obviously, they're involved in dramatic you know, events you know, uh, on a daily basis throughout the year and you know, overseas and wars, et cetera. But lots of data, lots of studies. And so these chest seals now, uh, this is a hyphen. There's halos, there's H&H, &H, hyphens probably. H hy hy halos and hyphens are probably the two most common ones that are used. They have vented and non-vented. So you can actually have a chest seal that has a vent where you don't have to worry about getting okay, attention in the thorax in theory. 
Um, blood can still get in there and can still clot and still still kind of cause issues and problems. But the concept of a vented chest cell break. If you have a chest cell that's not vented, what do you worry about? And somebody that has a penetrating trauma and you put it you put this chest wound on it, if you don't put a chest tube, what do you worry about having a tension pneuma? Okay? This is what I this is a hyphen seal, chest seal. Sometimes, you know, if you're out somewhere and you don't have a if you don't have a vented chest seal, okay, or you do have a vented chest seal on lots of blood, they'll call it removing it, burping the chest. Okay, so burping the chest wound is what they call it. And this is kind of a little video just talking about that. Once you notice that there's a thoracic injury, peel open our occlusive dressing and remove it from this package. And if you have a 2 by 2 or... The committee will tackle product casualty care for what's all these out. Today we're going to be talking to you about the application of a vented chest seal and occlusive dressing. And also we'll be going over how to burp the occlusive dressing. Step one, we're going to inspect the thorax. Once you notice that there's a thoracic injury, peel open our occlusive dressing and remove it from this package. And if you have a 2x2 two two or curl X, wipe away the blood away from the site of the injury. Apply the vented chest or occlusive dressing upon exhalation. That chest cell almost looks like a colostomy bag, little, little placement thing. <laughs> You've never seen that. Doesn't it? And he says, be sure to log roll your patient and check for a downside wound. Inspection of the downside injury, wipe the area away, and apply an occlusive dressing. Got to expose the patient. For demonstration Robert purposes, all over. we'll be applying an occlusive for dressing for on the downside injury. And again, apply on upon exhalation. And reassess. And that concludes the application of the vented chest seal and the occlusive dressing. Now we're going to talk about burping the wound. Upon reassessment, if you notice any clots formed or any increase in respiratory difficulty, to burp the wound, simply peel back the chest seal. If you notice they start crumping, clear any clot away. They start crumping, you can burp the chest seal. Reapply the chest seal upon isolation. After burping the wound, we're going to continue to reassess our patient. We're going to monitor for the development of a tension pneumothorax and document all care on a DD form 13A. So this patient obviously has a pneumothorax, pretty easy to see. What else do they have? What is that? Yeah, PCP pneumonia. It's an HIV patient with PCP pneumonia and pneumothorax. Pretty easy to see some of these pneumothoraces. Okay. All right, so what is this up here? ET2. Okay, you see the radio paint markers in it here. Okay, what is this right here? Chest tube. Chest See, it's got radio paint markers. See this little hole? See where the, where the marker stops right here? That's a port. Okay, here's a port. Okay, it's always real important that your chest tube is inside the chest wall. Okay, it's not going to pull the lung up if the chest ports are outside the chest wall. Correct? Okay, and you're going to have a crazy air leak because obviously that's outside the chest wall. Does that make sense? We put in chest tubes, you know, after we put it in, we put in, a, we, we take a chest x-ray to see one where the placement of the tube is to go where you want to go is it pull the lung up, okay? But you get daily chest tube, chest x-ray as well, okay? Sometimes you can go, hey, well, you know, patient actually stepped on it now the port's out. But there's other things you can see to do, but um, these radio opaque lines make it easier to see 
your tooth. This patient has a little tiny anterior catheter, so a small <coughs> diameter that is. Attention to authorities, we talk about the kill, we talk about all this, okay? Uh, here's kind of the picture that depicts this. With all the expanding pressure, it, it impedes the venous return and pushes you know, tracheal deviation. The tracheal deviation is always a way, right? If, because it's, if, you have a, if you have penetrating chest around the right chest, you develop a tension in the thorax, that air is pushing it to the opposite side. So the tension in the thorax is away from the side of your injury. <coughs> So, I mean, this, is, I mean, this isn't an awful tension in both arts. We see a little bit of style shift. See the medial shadow shift and the tracheal deviation. Okay. <coughs> you see this, you're like, holy crap, okay? This is chest x-ray, you see. You know, you know it's one of those things, too. Um, if you're ever calling a code, okay? Technological advances in, in ACLS, defibrillators, okay, AEDs. Nine times out of ten, if this patient isn't alive by the time they got to the hospital, they're not going to, okay, they're not going to make it. They've been down 20, 30, 40 minutes before they get to you, okay? Before you ever call a code, okay, regardless for any reason, needle decompress both chests, okay? Because if they come in and they go and they get an autopsy and they come in, well, P.A. Smith, this patient had a tension in the he didn't need to rest. Why is that? Okay? So, before you call a cardiac arrest and somebody that has chest trauma has some reasons to suspect a tension in the you know, you can always do the decompression. Okay? Pretty impressive x ray. Okay? So, where do we need to decompress? Mid clavicular line, okay? Second intercostal space. The second intercostal space is between the second and the third rib, right? <coughs> so lots of times you can't feel the first rib. Sometimes it's kind of right underneath that clavicle there, okay? So mid clavicular line, okay? The alternative place that we can also do it is the anterior axillary line, fourth, fifth intercostal space, which is where we put chest tubes too, okay? Locate the second or fossil space, make your line, mark the location, cleanse the area. So, there's things that have kind of changed actually in the last month or so as far as the committee and trauma and recommendations for the size of the NG cap that we use to treat attention pneumothorax. Um, in the past, the recommendations have been a 3 and a quarter, 14 gauge catheter. It's a 3.25 inches, okay? 14 gauge <coughs> catheter. This is a 14 gauge angio cap. Inch and a quarter. So, smaller the number, the bigger the diameter of the catheter, right? Okay? So, this is inch and a quarter, so this isn't how we, the size of the length that we use, okay? So, they've actually recently recommended in, in tactical medicine, this is called the spear, okay? This is a 10 gauge, 3.75 inch catheter, okay? You get some of these big people have a lot of muscle mass, have a lot of tissue or adipose tissue, that catheter can get displaced out of the chest wall. You want to make sure they have a big enough catheter, okay? And this is a beast. Lots of times, you know, once you get through that chest wall, you're going to hear a pop. You may or may not hear a rush of air, okay? These are the typical ARS depression needles. These are the ones that, that before the kind of spear. So they'll come in that little container like that. They're smaller. And again, they're 3.25 inches, 3 and 4 inches. And you can get them to 14 and 10 gauge. But the new one is a 10, 3.75. Here's the spear needle. And the spear stands for Simplified Pneumothorax Emergency Air Release Kit. It's actually pretty cool. Uh, it comes with a little one-way valve at the end of it, and a little flexible catheter. Uh, it's really pretty, 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 pretty neat. There's a attachable one-way valve after you get through and you place the catheter and remove the, the angio cap. You move the needle from the angio cap and you place that one-way valve. The one-way valve will make you continue to recurring tension in the thorax. I'm 
I'm Stefano, and I'm going to be going over the proper placement and insertion of a needle chest decompression. The signs of suspected tension pneumothorax, indicating the need for a needle decompression, are when a casualty has significant torso trauma or primary blast injury, and one or more of the following. Severe or progressive respiratory distress, severe or progressive tachypnea, absent or markedly decreased breath sounds on one side of the chest, Hemoglobin oxygen saturation less than 90% on pulse oximetry. Shock or traumatic cardiac arrest without obviously fatal wounds. Use a 14 or 10 gauge 3 and a quarter needle and catheter set and identify an insertion site. Our site is the second intercostal space, mid clavicular line, just lateral. You have to deviate one way or the other when you get laterally away from the medial sinus brake vessel. Under so that. away from the, the midline, line, for space. sure. You have to deviate a little bit lateral, okay? Second intercostal space, and the third rib. I'm going to use the third rib as the backboard, and then I'm going to ride over that third rib and advance the catheter and the shot. into the pore space. Once I pop through the pore space, I'm going to advance the catheter until it's flushed with the patient's skin. Now, that, with that right there, you know, they're saying three centimeters is really kind of where, as far as you really need to go in for a needle. Uh, and there's actually on this spear, there's a three cent, there's, there's mark if you can tell how deep you're in the chest wall. Once you get in about three centimeters, then you retract the needle and then hub it out. Okay, the last thing you want to do is stick that needle down in there deep, okay? Because, you know, do they have a pneumothorax? So sometimes, sometimes these people have other issues going on. I mean, and you're doing, and you're, you know, you're essentially the people that get a needle decompression are the people you suspect. You would not believe how many people get needle. By EMS, by EMS, but they come in and didn't need it. Okay, the term the EMS uses is we needled their chest, we darted their chest. Okay, and now they have a pneumothorax, now they put a chest tube. So sometimes they get a little eager about, and sometimes they do a great job doing wrong. But lots of times, some people are, are, are needled inappropriately and they don't need to be. Okay, but you know if you have a patient who's crumping, who's hypertensive, and trauma, there's nothing wrong with doing it. Okay, uh, they may or may not have one. But if you stick that needle down into the lung tissue and they don't have one, you're going to cause a, a parenchymal tear to the lung. Okay, does that make sense? So. About three centimeters really safe where kind of where you should be, retract the, the needle and then advance the injury cap. Does that make sense? That kind of contradicts a little bit of what you said. Hold it in place for five to ten seconds <laughs> to allow for decompression the and then remove the needle while leaving the catheter in place. If your first site is compromised, move to a second site. Our site is located between the fourth and fifth intercostal space, anterior axillary line. Somebody might have a gunshot wound in the chest right here, too. That's another alternative side. Moving the nipple, we will Inter work at our site. Remember to go over the rib to avoid the nerve artery and vein bundle. The needle decompression should be considered successful if respiratory distress improves or there is an obvious hissing sound as air escapes from the chest when the NDC is performed. This may be difficult to appreciate in high noise environments, or hemoglobin oxygen saturation increases to 90% or greater. Note that this may take several minutes and may not happen at altitude. Or a casualty with no vital signs has a return of consciousness and or a radial pulse. If your casualty is conscious, place them in a position. We take care of these patients. If you get a tension in the thoracic, you continue to have to reassess and reassess and reassess. Because you get better, then they may kind of reaccumulate and have to take another needle. So continually reassess. If the initial NDC fails to improve the casualty's signs and symptoms from the suspected tension in the thorax, they perform a second NDC on the same side of the chest at whichever of the two recommended sites was not previously used. Use a new needle catheter for the second attempt. Consider, based on the mechanism of injury and physical findings, whether decompression of the opposite side of the chest may be needed. If the initial NDC was successful, but symptoms later reoccur, then perform another NDC at the same site that was previously used. Use a new needle catheter unit for the repeat NDC. This catheter is about 20, that, that spear is like 20 bucks a piece. Very expensive. Oh, sorry, the other one's about 10. Okay, so what do we call blood in the pearl space? It's a hemothorax, okay? So sometimes it's hard to tell when people have this meniscus here. You see the occluded diaphragmatic border. Okay, is it blood? Is it pleural fluid? Okay, um, you know obviously instead of a trauma, you're assuming it's a hemophilia. 
Okay? Sometimes people will have some pleural effusion, some crazy infection, they may have lung cancer, they may whatever. So kind of in the setting, we see an extra this is, you know, in the setting of trauma, that's blood in the chest. Just like when you get a, a, a pneumothorax, the air is disrupted, okay, the negative pressure is disrupted. So, let's say you have a patient that comes in, they were gunshot wound to the chest, they were stab wound to the chest. If you put in a chest tube and you're getting 1,500 cc's of blood, okay, 1.5 liters immediately or 200 an hour for three or four consecutive hours, those patients need to go to the operating room for a thoracotomy, okay? And, and the reason is, is they're bleeding out either from a pulmonary vessel that's been damaged or an intercostal vessel that's been damaged. We had a trooper uh, about two months ago, uh, gunshot wound, he hit his best. Got an intercostal vessel bleed, okay, uh, and go to surgery a couple hours later. So, um, you know, and that's one of the things, the last thing that causes, you know, when you're putting in a chest tube, okay, is cause an intercostal vessel. So that's why it's so important to go on the superior surface of the rib, okay. Y'all know what a thoracotomy is, okay? Slice the chest, okay? Um, the only true, this is kind of important, uh, the only true indication for an emergency department thoracotomy, ED thoracotomy is where we, we slice and crack the chest needed, okay? The only true indication for an ED thoracotomy is a patient with penetrating trauma who lost their pulse at the door, okay? So what you'll do is you'll take, you'll, take a, you'll take a scalpel and you'll slice the ribs, you put in the rib spreaders, and what are you trying to do? What's the purpose of cracking the chest? Trying to find, trying to find a hole in the heart, okay? If you can put a finger, if you can put, if it's a hole in the heart, you can put a folded cap in there and tamp it on. If you can hold pressure, cross clamp the aorta, buy them some time to get the aorta, they can get repair, okay? I've seen probably uh, 12 or 11 chests that got cracked, and of course, most of you died. One, the only guy that died was a child muster. They did not die. The only guy that made it was a child muster, and he rotted in our hospital for about three months and later died. But. You know, people, people with penetrating trauma that lose, that lose their pulse right here, oftentimes it's, it's unrecoverable bleeding, okay? There's an ED doctor south of Oklahoma City about four years ago that cracked a chest on a hypotensive crashing patient who was septic because of a gallbladder. Needless to say, he got sued. Hemothorax, obviously it's best seen on an upright chest x-ray. We talk about any accumulation that the fluid that hides the cosmetic angle in upright chest is enough for fire drainage. So if you can see it, sometimes you can drain it. Because you leave that fluid that goes on drain, you can develop an empyema and infection. Okay? Portal fusion is transudate or extradate in the portal space. Sometimes, you know, also laying it out, getting a lot of acute x rays, someone can help people tell. And, you know, on a CT scan, one of the things a radiologist can do on a CT scan, it's hard to tell if the pleural fluid is blood, is they can, they can look at the Hounsfeld units to see the density of the fluid to see if it's more like fluid versus blood. Flow chest, okay, here's a board question. The definition of a flow chest is what? Two or more ribs broken, two or more two more places. Okay, so flail chest, man. You, you know you can get these people, you know, have an isolated chest trauma. You know, say this guy that was working on a car and the car fell on his chest, and he's got a flail segment. And lots of times, these people get look at a big pulmonary contusion, they have these rib fractures, and really, if you can alleviate their pain, a lot of times you can you can keep them from getting intubated, okay? If you get these patients on the ventilator, sometimes it's very difficult to get them off. And so what happens when people have rib fractures, it hurts, okay? You take a deep breath, it hurts. You twist, you move, it hurts. So people don't take deep breaths when they have rib fractures. Um, can I tell people your lung is a big balloon that's made up of a bunch of small balloons, you're not taking deep breaths, you don't fill up all the distal alveoli. And so what happens, that's what collapses, the alveoli collapse and that leads to pneumonia. And so when you get these patients that have, that have flail chest and are kind of isolated type of stuff, lots of times you can do an epidural, okay? If anesthesia come in and do an epidural and alleviate a lot of their pain, allow them to breathe and keep them from getting pneumonia, okay? Because these people will often get pneumonia because they're not taking deep breaths because it's very, very, very painful, okay? These people with, you know, rib fractures, 
you know, they're gonna they're gonna hurt for three to four months. You know, you tell them, hey, even it's one or two cracked ribs. Every time you laugh, you cough, you fart, you twist, you turn, it hurts. Okay, and we talk about people with rib fracture. People come in the in the ER all the time. Hey, I fell, I hit the rib, or I hurt my rib, I cracked my rib. You tell people. You may or may not have a broken rib. Just because we don't see it doesn't mean you do. Oftentimes it's more of a clinical diagnosis. It hurts when you laugh, you twist, you take a deep breath, you move. They probably cracked a rib. Just because we don't see it doesn't mean they don't have fractured ribs. The reason we do chest x-rays with people that feel a head, you know, for rib fracture make sure they don't have any more thorax. Any more thorax. Okay. Any other questions? One of the things, if somebody has a, a, a flail chest, one of the things you think you see visually in inspection of somebody with a, a flail chest? Asymmetric movement of the chest wall, okay? Uh, sometimes you feel crepitous, okay? Sometimes you feel kind of, you look, look at subcutaneous emphysema and you feel kind of feel like kind of respiratory treats, okay? But more crepitous is kind of the big thing that you feel with a, an, a, an asymmetric chest expansion, okay? <coughs> Refractures here and lateral. It's another definition of a flat chest for both sides. Okay. The treatment for pleural conditions: how we treat a pneumothorax or a hemothorax. Okay. We remove the air in the fluid by putting in tubes. Okay. Thoracostomy tube, chest tube. Thoracostomy is the is the technical medical term for costing tube placement. Okay? And by sucking that air, that blood out restores the negative pressure to help the lungs expand. Uh, you know, chest tubes, there's a ton of different sizes, there's a ton of different shapes. Um, you know, there's curved tubes, there's straight tubes. Typically, if we're putting a chest tube in for air in an adult, a 28 French to 32 French will suffice. If you know they have a hemothorax, you want to put in a bigger tube, like a 36 or a 42. What happens when they have a hemothorax? Have you ever seen anybody or a family member had a JP drain? You know what a JP drain is? Okay, fibrin occurs in those tubes, in those JP drains. And that fibrin clots, clots the drain where it can't drain. The same thing can happen in a chest tube, okay? So when you know you have a hemothorax, you don't use a smaller type tube because sometimes those can kind of can clot up and stop draining. Um, if the tube stops draining because of fibrin, so we kind of call it a dead tube, it's not working any longer. Um, they use some stuff sometimes in IVs, it's, you know, IVs sometimes will clot up a clot, it's kind of a clot buster, they'll sometimes they can put in a, in a chest tube to see if it will kind of eradicate, dissolve the, the, the fibrin. The same with when somebody gets a central line or a pick line or an IV, it's not working, so it's a little bit of clot busting, kind of heparin type of stuff in there. Okay? So this is a trocar, okay? This comes inside me, some of these tubes and these deals, and it looks like a tent state, okay? Never use a choke bar to put in a chest tube. It's got a little pointy end. Uh, I've seen where these have gone into people's heart and into people's lung tissues before. Your attendees will just like, they'll be crapping their pants and you'll be getting your ass chewed for about an hour if they walk in and see you with a choke bar in your hand. They'll never use a choke bar to place a chest tube. Some of these older school attendees, they will, but you know, they make the big bucks and they call the shots. But you should never use a choke bar to put in a chest tube. Okay? So, the chest tube is placed into it, it's attached to the drainage system that allows to remove it out of, out of the chest wall, okay? And how a chest drainage system works is suction is going to help drain the fluid, yes, it helps it drain better, but you will still drain your fluid without the chest tube. Okay? <coughs> suction improves the speed at which the air in the fluid pulls from the chest, okay? This is a pleurovac here, okay? Back in the day, they used to have these things called wet suction. Um, they use a lot of thoracics and they make the, the water seal itself, the water was the barrier to keep the outer, the outer air from coming in, the water meniscus itself, okay? And they had to turn them up real high on suction, they bubble, there are a lot of noise, okay? This is what we call, this is what we use now, it's kind of standard, it's called a dry suction pleurolac, okay? So when you open it up, there's a little, there's a little, like a little uh, container in the back that has water in it, and we pour it in here. So people say, hey, if it's dry, why do you have water, okay? It's because of this. This is an air leak indicator, is what the water's for. So when you open it up, it's, this is how much pressure you're setting on suction to put the, the pleurovac back, back up. It's set to 20 automatically. Very rude to ever change it off to of 20. If you put in a, a chest tube and the lung doesn't expand all the way, we can kind of bump it up to 30. But very rarely, sometimes they need it up to 2. Okay? So 
There's a little orange ball in here. When it sucks up the suction, the ball is floating in the air. When everything's functioning appropriately, it sucks up the suction, the ball is floating. Okay? And then here's the air leak indicator. So this tube right here, after you put in the check tube, okay, you'll have the nurse hand this to you, okay? And this is what hooks up to the, the chest tube, okay? This is what helps suck air and stuff out of the chest wall. Okay? Um, so this is kind of how that works. Okay? This back here is a cell saver. So if somebody is, you know, they have a couple of liters of blood in here, you can actually they can auto-transfuse it back to themselves. Okay? And see so you can do it in the OR. When you know, when I put a chest tube in, I mark how much it's been out. Say, say I put the chest tube in and there's a 400 cc, I've got 400 cc's of blood out. I'll mark my name and my initials and the time of when, of when that happened. That way, when I go to see the patient the next day, you know, a trauma service, you know, we would admit these patients. We'd admit them and take care of them having to discharge. So, we, so, you know, management of the chest tube is important. If you just work ER, you put it in a chest tube, you don't worry about it. You don't ever see them again, okay? So, but if you're on a, a pulmonary service or a cardiovascular service or a trauma service, you're going to be managing chest tubes, okay? So, the last thing we want to do is pull a chest tube that's putting out too much blood, right? When you remove a chest tube is when you, the pneumothorax is resolved, the lung is back up, okay? And there's minimal output, okay, out the chest tube, right? Does that make sense? Okay? So, don't ever trust INOs, okay? I know 100%, I'm not relying on anybody's documentation by INO. I know 100%, if I saw him yesterday at 7 a.m., when I come at 7 a.m., there's 400 yesterday, there's 500 a day, I know 100%, there's 100 cc's output in the last 24 hours. So, it's crazy, sometimes, your hospital's on divert, you're turning trauma patients away because you don't have beds, all because you couldn't send a patient home and remove that chest tube because nobody documented I knows. Okay, you're not gonna pull a chest tube out and put another one in because he's putting out too much chest drain. Does that make sense? Okay. <coughs> so the pleural back rests on the bed, gravity helps draining, okay, it's below the chest. Okay. Uh, this little port right here, we hook this up to suction to wall suction. So this goes to the chest, this goes, this is a suction tubing, goes from here to the wall. Okay. This is the old wet suction floor bag we're talking about. You know, when you work in a hospital, no matter what your what equipment you have, whether it's your quarterback, your airway equipment, your intubating equipment, whatever, you know, your easy IO drill, whatever you have, your cry kits, be familiar with what you have, okay? And play, get out and play with it. Because the last thing you want to do is open up some box or some equipment you've never used, you get a traumatic patient in and you've never used it before. Okay? You want, to, you want to know what you have. Okay? So as we talk about the air leak indicator. When you have a hole in the pleura and you have a pneumothorax, you have an air leak. Does that make sense? Right? Okay? And a typical small little rib fracture, a little small tiny typical pneumothorax, oftentimes that pleural injury will heal up in 12 to 24 hours after being on suction. Okay? When somebody has, well, after we put the chest tube in, we walk in every day, we'll ask them to cough. We'll go, <coughs> when they cough, that little ball up there, will float in little bubbles. If they have an air leak, there's going to be bubbles. If it's a big leak, the bubbles go all the way to number five. Number five is huge leak. It's a huge air leak. So if somebody has a huge air leak, okay, they're going to be on they're going to be on the on, on suction for a while. Okay? But most common small, typical little pneumothoraces, often oftentimes that little hole in the pearl will heal you know, 12 to 24 hours after being on suction. Okay? But one of the things you always want to evaluate is have them cough. Okay? If there's an air bubble, still have an air leak. Don't take them off suction. Does that make sense? If the suction is working, that little orange ball there should be floating, okay? If you walk into the room and the patient's supposed to be on suction, you walk over and see that ball, something's wrong, okay? Either there's a problem at the chest or the chest wall, at the suction, at the suction container, you kind of have to be an investigator to find out where the problem is. Start at the wall, give suction at the wall. So you have to investigate and troubleshoot a lot of things, okay? There's it set 20 centimeter suction we talked about, okay? At the wall, when we talk about suction, we set it, I set it to medium, continuous suction, okay? Not intermittent suction. When you put an NG tube in somebody, you set it to low intermittent suction, okay? That pleurovac is set at 20, okay? So you can crank it to 50 or 60, it's not going to go over 20. You know, just because you're, you may say 20 on your wall, it may be 18, it may be 17, I think it's regulated. So I, I kind of crank it up to medium at the, uh, at the at the wall. So medium continuous suction. Okay? You know, we get a you know we get a trauma page coming out, hey gunshot wound in the chest, stab wound in the chest. We have all our equipment out. Okay, we have our chest tubes out, we have our pleurovacs out, we have suction, we have everything, we have our kits. 
or we can slam a chest tube in when they get in. Okay? This is a disposable thoracotomy, thoracotomy placement kit, which is what I have here. I'll show you all here in a little bit. Okay? It's got all the stuff in it. It's got gauze pads, it's got petroleum gauze, all your instruments. Here's a non disposable. These are instruments that we have to get sterilized and central sterile. You have a scalpel, you have scissors, you have forceps and pickups, needle driver, curve hemostats, trauma shears. A big curved Kelly is really what you need, which is a small Kelly there. This is your suction canister, okay, uh, at the wall, which you're really not going to use, but there's suction tubing behind it. There's your suction, your wall suction here, okay? So there you see the medium and the yellow up there, okay? So I turn it on the continuous and just crank it up to medium. You're not collecting stuff in the canister because you're collecting it in the tubes. There's suction tubing, there's a chest tube and a trocar, here's your pleura bag. It's really kind of funny this picture, this is a buddy of mine, we're taking this picture. I had to stretch the pictures and he looks like he has a long mailbox or a loaf of bread head here. <laughs> I see him in this picture about once a year to put him in this place. Obviously, you know, sterile, sterile gowns and gloves, okay? You know, when you, when you open the chest wall sometimes, blood is just kind of squirting everywhere, okay? It gets, gets you in the eye, gets you in the face, gets you in your crotch, gets you in the shoes, okay? It can go everywhere. Chest tube insertion sites, steps, okay? First thing we do is mark our plates. We're going to mark our landmarks, okay? A lot of times what I'll, need, what I'll use is the cap of a needle, okay? I'll take a cap of a needle and make an indention in the skin and take it off and you'll see. That way before you clean it, you'll, you'll really know where your site is, okay? Uh, that way you don't have to go back and wonder where I'm at. So you can mark your spot and take your floor prep and clean your area, okay? Surgically prepare and drape the chest. You want to really anesthetize these people very well, okay? This is a barbaric procedure, okay? We're putting a garden hose through the ribs, okay? So the first thing you want to do is make a wheel at the skin where you're going to make your incision, okay? And then you're going to track down over the track to where you're going to go, okay? And then actually into the floor space. Be very generous, okay, with uh, lidocaine, okay? Probably the first mistake that people make when they're putting in the chest tube is they don't make their incision long enough. You've got to make an incision long enough to get your fingers, the instruments, and the tools through. Okay? That's probably the first mistake that people make. Okay? Here's kind of the anatomy that we talked about. Okay? Shows you going over the top of the rib. The second mistake that people make when they put in a chest tube is our intercostal muscles, they go in opposite directions, right? Okay? So especially get these, you know, if you get a 90-year-old lady as opposed to some 40-year-old guy or 30-year-old guy who's all muscled up, sometimes it's like poking, <coughs> poking your finger through a wet paper towel versus trying to stick a, a, a knife through, you know, three-inch thick sheetrock or something. I mean, it's tough, okay? So lots of times we're trying to poke that, that, that curved Kelly in the intercostal muscles. Sometimes you're pushing them off the table. You're pushing so hard, you're almost pushing them off the table. Okay? So we anesthetize them, we give them medication. We give lots of times, depending on the setting where you're at, you can use conscious sedation, uh, depending on your setting, you can use morphine, a little bit of uh, but really be generous with pain medication. These are very, very difficult to hurt a lot. Okay? So I'll open this up here real quick. This is a great glove, okay? You have needles in here, you can make your mark, and I'll show you all here in a minute. This is a curved Kelly, okay? And how I tell people to hold it in your hand is hold it like a T, hold it with your fist. And it's kind of like, you know, you guys have learned by now, doing, if, if y'all done any intubation at all, okay? As you're gonna learn this next week, it's about form. Okay, if you're not rocking the teeth, it's kind of like you're weightlifting. You do it right. You do it so when you're when you're doing intubations, it's kind of up on the way, not cranking on the teeth. Kind of, I kind of get my arm at 90 degrees, and I'm kind of using my push and I kind of push straight in. Okay, and I hold it like this. Okay, and then I put my hand as a guide for when I do poke through, that my hand will stop up against the body and not jam this instrument into their lung and into their chest. Okay, does that make sense? So because sometimes you don't know how much it's going to push, 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 and once it breaks through my hand will stop at their chest wall. Does that make sense? Okay? So, we, make, we numb them up, 
we make an incision. A lot of the time, what I'll do, you know, some people have a little bit of adipose tissue, some people have very little. I'll take scissors, open close, open close, open close, open close. Sometimes you can feel the rib for so much adipose tissue, okay? So sometimes you have to dissect two, three inches. You open close scissors, open close, open close, and it's so easy to get you down and kind of feel where you're going, okay? So, the next mistake, after you puncture through, the people make is they just, they puncture, they poke through, they're in the chest wall, and they pull their Kirk Kelly's out, then they can't find their hole, okay? So what you have to do after you puncture that chest wall is open up these big curved kellys and get them like this and you pull out with them open, okay? Because that's going to help make that, make that hole big enough for you to find it, okay? Because the intercostal muscles go in each direction. If you don't, if you don't open up and spread this, you're not going to be able to find your hole. You're going to make a hole and you can see your finger there and you can't even find where you went. Can't even get okay? What do we do next? So we've made our hole, we pull it out. We want to make sure that we can push that lung tissue away from the chest wall. Why is that? Okay. When you put in a chest tube into the chest wall, that lung is going to kind of freely move out of the way. That chest tube is going to, going to go back there in the pleural space. If somebody's ever had a really bad pneumonia, necrotizing pneumonia, or they've had an empyema, they've had previous chest surgery, they've had a previous chest tube, you can get adhesions to your lung, and the lung can stick up to the chest wall. So before you put a tube in, you've got to push your finger in there to make sure that you can freely push that lung away from the chest wall. If you, if you can't push that lung away from the chest wall when you put that chest tube in, that lung's not going to move out of the way and that chest tube is going to tear into the lung tissue and you have a big problem and then you surgery. Okay? That make sense? Choose your side. Here's my finger. Palpating. Okay, that's anterior axial line, fourth, fifth intercostal space, about the level of the nipple in the male. Okay? So I, I poke in with a little needle, a little blunt, and you see as I let out, you can see, you see that little circle area? See the mark? Never know my spot is, okay? So I'll take chloroplast and I'm cleaning it. You can use betadine scrub, which is, takes a long time. You're supposed to let it sit on there for a few minutes, but chloroprep is really the standard that everybody uses, okay? These little things you clip when you break and the liquid comes out on the end, you scrub, 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 scrub. Okay? Anesthetize, now obviously, I would have one gloves if I were really doing this procedure. Okay? I can't my buddies, I got that thing really close to the skin, I'm glad I didn't move. So I was right there. So, these are some things in the kits. Um, this is a little guide that's supposed to kind of help you place them and put it where you want to go. It. When you're going to put in a chest tube for air, you ideally want to kind of point it towards the apex of the lung, okay? This has a little clip that can get in these little ports right here, okay? I believe if it's a pneumothorax, you want to try to get it up towards the apex. If it's a pneumothorax, you want to guide it to the base. Sometimes it goes where it wants to go. I don't like those. I kind of throw those away. After, okay, we've talked about it. We numbed them up. We made our skin incision. We dissected down. We used our curved kelly. We made a hole. We opened it up. We pulled it back. We stuck our finger in, okay, and we pushed along the way from the chest wall, right? Next thing we do is put in our chest tube, okay? So, I think one of the most important things that you must do before you put it in is put a clamp on the back side of this chest tube, okay? Because if you don't, as soon as you get this in, you're going to squirt your crotch or your shoes or your neighbor's crotch with blood if you don't put a clamp on the back of it. It's going to happen a million times, okay? So put a clamp on As soon as you get in that chest wall, Blood and fluid stuff is going to come out for the hemocorps, okay? It's going to shoot out this other end like a rocket, okay? How I like placing is I like taking the big curved kellys and I like putting them on the undersurface of the chest tube because it kind of, it kind of follows, follows with the shape of my, of my instrument, okay? If I do it on the top, it really kind of, it does, it kind of makes it wider, you know what I mean? It's wider and makes you have a bigger hole to get in the chest wall. So when you kind of put it on the undersurface of the, of, the, of the tube and you hold it like this, okay, it makes it easier to put it in. So I kind of put my finger in the hole, I'm kind of feeling, I'll get this down through the hole, and once you get it in, lots of times you're going to see this tube is going to fog, okay? Once the tube fogs, and you're in, you open it, and you, and you pass the chest tube in. These have markers on them as well, some of you, okay? You've seen, oh, I don't know if you've seen anybody measure an inch or two, so lots of things you do kind of where you need to go, if your hole's here, you come kind of measure, hey, the apex of the lung is kind of right here, it's about a, it's about a, 
you know, 10 to 12 on, on, on females is kind of the average of where you're at. It's about a 14 to 16 on males, kind of where you should be. Uh, but, you know, because all these tubes are different and the ports are different places, you always want to make sure that your ports are inside the chest wall. If your ports are not inside the chest wall, you're going to have this crazy air leak, okay, because the air is just communicating. Does that make sense? These have to be inside the chest wall, okay? So, after we put it in place, we have to sew it. What can I sew here? What can I, what can I cut? Are you all done with these donuts that they did? Okay. All right, we're just gonna, we're going to poke a hole in this box here. We're going to make a hole. Okay. I'm going to pass this in there. Okay. And so there's two ways to sew a chest tube. One of them is a purse stitch. Purse stitch is like, not for you guys, not for y'all. But the, the cinch strap on a purse. You can make a U stitch. The thing I don't like about the U stitch is it's a two person job removing the chest tube. Okay? Plus, it torques the skin, it pulls around, it twists the skin, it makes for a nasty scar, it looks ugly and it hurts. And when you remove the chest tube, you have to, you have, to have two people to help you do it. Okay? So, it's one of those things where. The other way is a much better aesthetic, aesthetic way of doing it is easier. Okay? So I'm going to take this is a big O silk. So when you're doing these, the sutures that you want to use is an O silk. A straight keep needle is a straight needle, looks like a sewing needle that's on the plus thread, but O silk, the bigger the, the shorter, the lower the number, the, the bigger the suture. Okay? So what I'm gonna do, have y'all done suturing? Not at all. Okay. A simple interrupted stitch on both sides. So I'm gonna go in one side, let's see how let's do this. Cardboard, maybe. Okay. Alright, perfect. So what I'm gonna do is you'll need two sutures, okay? After you get your needle through right here, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take scissors and get rid of your sharp. Okay? Don't let me get out of getting this needle, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it where the threads are e equal length. Everybody see? You want me to back up and on that deal back there? Everybody see? So I pull it where it's equal length, okay? And all I'm going to do is just a simple tie, okay? Just a simple knot. You can do an instrument tie or you can do, or you can do a hand tie, okay? And I'm going to tie a couple knots here. Or you can do an instrument tie. Okay. You, know, you can do like this and grab through and pull well, not through if you want to do that. Okay. The answer is hand tie. Okay. I've got four or five knots there. Okay. The last thing you want to do is put in a chest tube and they go up to take a leak and they get out and they step on their step on their hose and they pull their chest tube out. Okay. You're getting big trouble there. So you have to secure these things. You don't want them to come out. Okay. So what you do is with that suture, is you're going to take and you're going to wrap around in opposite directions. Okay. You're going to wrap this one this way. You're going to wrap this one this way. Okay. Go around a couple times. I've never put a chest tube in a donut box before. <laughs> okay. So what I'm going to do is, is then I kind of pull this kind of down. Where, and what I'm going to do is now I'm going to do a simple tie on this chest tube. I'm just going to tie another knot right here. Okay. And you have to give it some force. You want to indent, put a little indent in this because you don't want it to come out. Okay. So I'm going to put a little indent there. I'm going to do another couple ties. Okay. Go like this, okay. Then I take scissors, okay. And so there's that side. And so what I'll do is an identical one more stitch on the other side, just like this. So I close the skin edges on this side of it, and it's attached to here. I'm gonna put one more stitch, just like that, okay. And then what we'll do is we'll put some. I'm not gonna open it up. Some Vaseline gauze, okay. It's, it's, it's petroleum based gloss we'll put around here, okay? And then we're going to take some 4 by 4s okay? Which we'll do to cut them in half. And we're going to do all this tomorrow, but it's just kind of easier. We kind of talk about what we're doing and why we're doing it. 
Here, Dad, so we so we more so to you. So put Vaseline gauze on here. <laughs> okay. And then we're gonna put these four by fours underneath here, sideways, all the time around, patting, it's gonna catch a lot of stuff that leaks out of it, okay? And then I'll use foam tape. The foam tape is amazing. It will stick like no other, okay? But you can cause blisters if you really stretch it tight, okay? And when you pull this tape off of people, pull the skin away from the tape instead of shredding the tape. And then what we'll do is we just tape it up, okay? And then we'll get a, a chest x ray, okay? So that's kind of how it, that's kind of how you put them in, okay? So when do we pull chest tubes out, okay? So this chest tube, it's hooked up to suction, okay? It's draining into the pleural back. When the chest tube is on suction, we kind of call it suction, okay? When we take it off of suction, it's called placement to water seal. And that term is based off of the previous chest tubes, the pleurovacs that were water-based seals. Okay, this is a dry chest, but taking it off of suction is the term placement to water seal means taking it off of suction. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, there's the petroleum gauze we talked about wrapping around. There's the four by four dressing. Okay. And like I said, the last thing you want to do is get up to the bathroom and pull that thing out. So it is taped in there, but I also tape it here and I'll put a piece of tape down lower and kind of tape it that. It's kind of secured at two points. Okay? The last thing you want to do is to pull out. Okay? And there they are hooked up to the suction and the floor of that hooked up to the wall. Okay? Anterior chest tubes. Anterior chest tubes really don't use a lot in the setting of trauma. Anterior chest tubes are really kind of often used for people with spontaneous pneumothoraces who have a tiny little small pneumo and they can kind of put one in. The problem with anterior chest tubes is, is oftentimes, you know, obviously you don't put in for hemothorax, you put in for just a hemothorax. The problem with an anterior chest tube is sometimes if you're jacking around with this little small tube in and you don't get the lung all the way up and you play over two or three days and you can't get the lung all the way up and now you have to turn over, start over, put in a real chest tube. Mm -hmm. Had you put in a real chest tube the first time, they'd be home, okay? So I think really in you know, a traumatic setting and trauma patients, the only time we'd ever really use an anterior chest tube is if somebody had a chest tube and, and they got a residual hemothorax after you pulled the tube. They had a recurrent pneumothorax and it was small. I think it's really the only time you may use those, but we didn't really use it a lot in, in the acute setting. Interventional radiology, they love using small tubes, okay? Um, lots of patients who manage inpatients who really don't have a lot of knowledge with chest tubes and know how to put them in. They're okay with whatever they go to interventional radiology, do what they want to do, so they really have a say, or really a lot of really good knowledge about what's best for the patient sometimes. But in the setting of trauma, an anterior chest tube is really not appropriate. Sometimes they're called a cook catheter, okay, or a THAL, T H A L, on the anterior tubes. This is something that's pretty cool. Um, it's called a true closed thoracic vent, and what it is is essentially uh, it has a small tube, kind of like an angio like an cap tube or a needle decompression tube. It has a little small trocar like this long, and on the back of it is a piece of dressing. And so, in that container, you can actually hook someone up to suction, and it, it I think collects about 15 to 20 mLs of blood and you can hook for suction. I think the people these are really better for are sometimes, you know, the battlefield, um, uh, some of these people who get a gunshot wound to the chest uh, that, you know, you don't have the capability to put in a chest tube and you're going to put them on a helicopter because they have suction on the helicopter, uh, you know, or a tactical, you know, probably have shooting and somebody gets a gunshot wound to the chest, it's great to put them in, put them in a helicopter, they can actually get suction before they get to the trauma center where they're going. Um, sometimes some people, some pulmonologists will use these sometimes in a very small, spontaneous new mode. These, these are pretty cool, but you can hook up to suction. Okay? Um, another valve that you may hear anything about is like a Heimlich valve or one-way valve. Sometimes the people that have a, a little small pneumothorax, rigid pneumothorax, and so sometimes we'll send them home with a little anterior kit with a Heimlich valve. The Heimlich valve will take you from getting attention to the thorax. So complications of chest tubes we talked about. You know, puncture of intrathoracic and abdominal organs. Okay, I've seen chest tubes in people's bellies. I've seen them in their liver. Okay, I've seen them in the sub-Q skin all the way around the back. I don't repeat a one day for these tubes. Man, I just can't. Think. And you get the lateral, and it's like the sign of the chest wall. It's like it's like back here. So I, I've seen chest tubes everywhere. Okay, um, you can introduce pleural infection. Okay, never put a chest tube through a gunshot wound. Never put a chest tube through a stab wound. Okay, um, when we put in the chest tube, we'll say we get our chest X-ray, and it's a little far. You can retract it and re-sew it, that's fine. But if you get a chest tube and it's not in far enough, okay, you have to start over and get a new hole or, or a new or at least a new a new catheter. Okay, you don't have to get a new hole, but a new, a new chest tube. Because you don't want to 
introduce bacteria that's outside the, that's outside the chest wall into the chest wall space. You can retract it, that's fine, and resew it, but you don't want to advance the tube later. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you can convert a hemothorax to pneumothorax. Um, you can get, you know, chronic nerve pain, okay, intercostal neuritis, neuralgia, um, kinking of tubes, uh, all kinds of issues, persistent pneumothorax, large pulmonary artery leak, leak around the skin of the chest tube, suction is too strong, leaking thoracic. You know, sometimes, uh, sometimes these quarterbacks are really just kind of messed up. Sometimes you'll, you'll come in, these patients are making funny noises. Sometimes they got knocked over, and you had, you know, you, some of these objects have like four different containers, and sometimes you have like 600 now spread in three different containers. So sometimes when they get knocked over, they kind of acting funny, but when you start having problems, nurses are so intimidated by chest tubes, by chest tube management, they just don't understand. And, and you know, so oftentimes it's easier, if you, you know, if you got a call about one of your patients who has a, a quarterback and a chest tube and the nurses are, you know, are like, I don't know what's going on, you know, just just go up and just, like I said, start from the front. Is there suction, there's suction at the wall, there's suction to the tube, is there suction to, to the chest tube, okay? Is this up and functioning appropriately? Is it loose here, okay? Take your dressing down. Is the chest tube outside the chest wall? Is the dressing loose, okay? Is there air leak more? It's just sometimes you have to just investigate, okay? Um, chest tube pearls, always such a lump break we talked about, make sure it moves away. Never place the chest tube in the gunshot, we'll talk about that. Um, talk about adhesions. Maybe the stroke car. Sometimes you get these people that sometimes have a small little, a tiny pneumothorax, and, and you can put them on, on oxygen, 100% oxygen, oftentimes they'll resolve a real small 10% pneumothorax, okay? Also really help, okay? When to remove chest tubes? There's kind of some terms. I'm just kind of just, just I'm just going kind to of, just kind of read through this for you to kind of understand. So, when the air leak is resolved, the chest extra shows resolution of the pneumothorax. You remove the chest tube from suction, which is also known as placing the pearl back to water seal. If it's a simple pneumothorax, you're going to leave the suction for 24 hours and place it to water seal only if the air leak is resolved. So we get chest X-ray examining the patients every day. So you walk in, you look at the chest X-ray. There's a lung up. You check if they have an air leak. Okay. Um, after you, after you take it off the of suction. You want to get another chest x-ray to make sure the lung didn't drop after you took it off the suction, okay? If the lung drops, you put it on suction for another 24 to 48 hours and try again, okay? So let's say we don't have an air leak. You took it off the suction. You got a chest x-ray. The lung's up. It didn't drop again. The next thing we look at before we remove a chest tube is how much output it's had, okay, in the last 24 hours. So kind of roughly 1 to 1.5 cc per kilogram in a 24-hour period. You know, so 70, 100 kilo. We've had 100, 120 cc's out in the day. No big deal. Okay, you can pull the tube. The last thing you want to do is pull the tube by putting out two or three hundred a day, because they're going to reaccumulate the other hemothorax. Okay, so after the mental requirements, their output is minimal. The lung state after we took it off the chest X-ray, we're going to pull the tube. Okay, so what we do, when we pull the tube is we take the dressing down. Okay. Take the dressing down. We'll get some more fresh 4x4s and a fresh inclusive dressing. And I'll get about four pieces of this foam tape. Okay? All I have to do, I don't have to have help taking this chest tube out. Okay? Because I'm not doing the first stitch. Okay? So all I do is I take the scalpel and I walk up. And all I'm cutting is that second knot on the tube. I'm not cutting the nut on the skin. Okay? So I'm going to walk up my scalpel and I'm just going to, on the tube itself, I'm going to cut this thread. Okay? So my suture holding the skin on that side is still intact. Okay, you'll see that that's still intact. So, so when I cut this, when I cut this, the knot on here, this one will also be intact. When I pull this tube out, my hole is this big. Okay, it's very small. Okay, so and keeping these sutures in helps that skin kind of lay down. It's a nice, pretty scar. It's not contorted and it's less scar tissue. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. So what I'll tell them to do is, I'll tell them to take a deep breath. I'll have this I'll have Vaseline gauze on my hand, in, on top of the cigar here. I'm gonna have them say, take a deep breath and exhale. I'm gonna pull it when they exhale. Okay? It's kind of hard to suck air in if you're exhaling. You know, some people say, take a deep breath and hold it. Okay? If you get, you know, if you get kicked in the groin or get hit in the gut, somebody takes your air away. Sometimes you go Ugh, and kind of gasp for air. Sometimes you pull these two thumbs with a little tug. So, if you, so see, you tell them to hold the breath and you, and you tug and they go, <gasps> they suck air and they're in the residual pneumothorax. Okay? So what you tell them to do is take a deep breath in and exhale. As they exhale in one fluid motion, I pull the tube and I lay the occlusive dressing that goes over, I put tape on it, and I get a chest x-ray in the gun. 
Okay. If I were to do the per stitch thing, okay, what I'd have to do is cut the knot on the tube like here. One person would have to pull the other tube, and the other person would have to cinch it up at the same time. So you increase your likelihood of getting air into the chest wall. Okay? And plus it contorts and twists the skin in some ugly looking spot. Okay? So um, next thing. One of the things I did not talk about. See how the skin's out here. This is the fat post tissue. And this is the tract of the chest wall. How the tract from the inside the chest wall to the outside is straight. Does that make sense? Okay. When I put in my chest tubes, I'll make my incision and in my wheel of lidocaine the rib below where I want to go, and I'm in a tunnel. Okay. So if I want to go right, if I want to put it in the inner of the chest wall above this rib. I want to make my incision kind of right down in here, okay? And what I do is I tunnel up over that rib so that way when I remove that chest tube, there's not a tunnel or a hole that, that chest wall will communicate directly with the outer atmosphere. Does that make sense? Because if you do, it's just a straight tunnel, straight path, increase your likelihood of getting a pneumothorax. So by, by tunneling, so I'll make, I'll make my incision, I'll make my incision here and I tunnel up and go over, I'll make my incision probably about, about in here, but I tunnel up over that rib. That way when I pull the tube, you decrease again your likelihood of getting a pneumothorax. So what happens is we bring them back to trauma clinic in a week, we take these stitches out, have a nice pretty wound, no big deal. Okay? Does that make sense? I could not get, there's a really cool, one of the cooler videos I've seen, uh, I couldn't get it to load on here. So I, I, I got on my email, I'll see if I can play here for you guys. I'm Andy and we're going to talk about how to do a chest tube. All right. So some indications that for a chest tube might be that you've had multiple unsuccessful needle decompressions, you have an extended transport time, or you have a delayed tachyvac. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to prepare the patient by putting them in the supine position and go ahead and have the affected side of the way arm and right raise it above right. their head. You're going to identify the area and then uh, clean it appropriately. Uh, in this situation, uh, it's the left side of the chest. We go to the mid axillary line. We go to the fifth intercostal space, which on males is about the nipple. So you just go just anterior to that uh, fifth intercostal space, mid axillary line. All right. In females, the nipple may be displaced inferiorly due to the large pendulous breast. So remember to stay above the inferior mammary fold where the nipple would normally lie. We're trying to use some sort of antiseptic, whether that be iodine, chlorhexidine, whatever it may be. Just make sure you use something that is a good antiseptic because you are going to be entering into the chest here. Okay, our next step in this procedure is to go ahead and anesthetize the area. An appropriate uh, local anesthetic might be 1 or 2% lidocaine and possibly marcaine also. Go ahead and insert the needle into the skin and go ahead and start to infiltrate the uh, anesthesia into the area. Uh, go ahead and make sure you aspirate as you go in. Continue to infiltrate the area and then get right over the uh, periosteum there and make sure you provide adequate amount of local anesthetic. All right, the next step uh, is go ahead and make our incision. Go ahead and take your blade, find your landmarks, make a two to three inch incision. Down to the rib. Go ahead and you feel the rib there. Once you have incised down to the rib, you go ahead and dig your nine inch peens, blood dissect over the area, go right over the top of the rib, into the chest wall, and expand your peens. Take it out. Go ahead and stick your finger into the chest wall over that rib. Go ahead and you're going to rotate your finger back and forth, making sure there's no adhesions and that you're inside the chest wall. Let's talk real quick about uh, using your peens to grasp your chest tube and insert it into the chest. 
can you see here we have the fenestrations along the part of the chest tube that goes inside the chest. You can also see that it is uh, numbered out here. When you take your peens, there are a couple different ways you can do this. You can pinch it here at the end Again, I like to be inserted. Over the top. Another method might be to put the peens through one of the eyelets to be inserted into the chest wall. And uh, you should use something that you feel comfortable with and that you can practice and you can do whenever you have to uh, put them in this situation. Okay, so, and this would be called, if I were just to do this by itself, this would be a finger thoracostomy. So if I have someone who may have some significant trouble breathing and I'm not getting that uh, relief with those neonic compressions, this may be a step that is appropriate. But here we're going to go move forward with our chest tube. I think the whole finger thoracostomy tube is kind of a big thing the military is kind of pushing for. I mean, you know, if you're out in the battlefield, sure, great, doing it. You know, if you don't have the ability to put in a chest tube, but if you're going to put in a chest tube, there's, it takes two more seconds to put in a tube. So I, I don't really know the, how helpful a finger or a costume is. I'm going to slide the chest tube past my finger over the rib and into the chest. I pull my finger out. It's inside the chest. I want to make sure then to continue feeding that in with the peens, making sure that all the fenestrations are inside of the chest. Remember, when inserting that chest tube, you want to try to aim anteriorly for a suspected pneumothorax or aim posteriorly and superiorly for suspected blood. Really, just superior. And then mark uh, the depth of that chest tube. Okay. Uh, depending on what type of chest tube you have, you may have a clamp down here at the sin that may be stopping any sort of fluid or blood from escaping from the chest. Uh, this chest tube itself does not require it. This uh, blue device down here stops any sort of blood from uh, escaping the, uh, the through the chest tube from the chest cavity. Once I've marked the depth of my chest tube, I'm going to look for fogging inside of the chest tube. And then I need to put it on my Heimlich valve. Depending on your brain and chest tube, you may need out. to cut off the end. Other times you may just need to undo the clamp. Your Heimlich valve. It's a one-way valve. Uh, if you don't know which way the end goes, the blue end goes on. It's a one-way valve allows air to escape and does not allow air to go back into the chest cavity. All right, let's suture this thing in place. You should have uh, silk uh, sutures or a, a similar type of suture, O-silk or something like that. When securing your chest tube in place, you're just going to simply do a, a simple purse string suture. Comes underneath the chest tube like this. Look how, you know, and when you tighten it up, it contorts the skin. Too simple to rest, it's much better. Somewhat of a uh, difficult position. Just make, uh, just modify how you, what you need to do to ensure that you're getting a good suture in there. Once you have your, uh, your purse string done, throw one overhand knot. Back and forth, again. It's the same way when you, you know, when you remove that. Tube. You're going to go back and forth up your chest tube. At any point in time, you can, if you're done suturing, you can remove the uh, move your needle. So once you're sufficiently uh, have your suture wrapped up the tube, just go ahead and place a piece of tape around the tube and make sure that you uh, close in and secure the suture within that tape. Uh, there are a lot of different techniques for uh, securing your chest tube. Uh, the important thing is is that uh, you get a good seal on it and that uh, it's not going to come out and you don't have any air or a fluid escaping from the chest. Um, in this distance, um, basically taking a chest seal type dressing, cutting it down the middle by halfway. I'm going to simply uh, wrap it up around the chest wall and an overlapping overlap it over the other one ideally you'd have a similar second dressing where you could cover it uh, in this direction ensuring that you have a much tighter chest seal and uh, on your chest tube okay once that's done uh, the only thing left to do is really secure the chest tube against the body uh, just so you don't want that out here kind of flopping around it can be done in, uh, again in any number of ways preferably just uh, simply taping it against that uh, body with uh, silk tape so once you uh, finally have your uh, chest tube in place go ahead and monitor for any improvement in your patient 
Uh, you're going to look for, you know, continue to look for any fogging or uh, blood in your chest tube. You're going to uh, document any blood loss, uh, and you're going to document the chest tube and all your care on a DD 1380 uh, to ensure that that, that that information is passed up the uh, chain there uh, to the uh, receiving facility. substitution for the feel of how much pressure it's going to take to puncture through the intercostal muscles or what it feels like to push the lungs away. Um, it's just like, have y'all have y'all intubated any any mannequins? Nothing. You guys, so it's kind of hard for you guys to know. You know, anytime you're doing skills, you know, you can do skills on, on mannequins all day long. And they have some of the coolest mannequins that are just crazy. Like we have this, we use this at uh, Oklahoma County SWAT school about a month or so ago. There's this new mannequin it's about forty thousand dollars and it has the ability to have asymmetric expansion for tension pneumothorax and we have blast injuries on one extremities and you can shoot blood blood shoots out on the arms and putting on tourniquets and you and if your tourniquets on appropriately they start bleeding and so there's some really cool lifelike mannequins and that are great skills and they're great for for honing your skills and getting good practice but there is no substitution for cadaveric Okay, specimens, getting, doing, intubating cadavers, putting chest tubes in cadavers. I mean, it's just, it's, there's, you can't, in regards to how good the mannequins and how good they are, nothing is a substitution of cadaver stuff. So, it's kind of hard for you guys, you really haven't had much exposure to the mannequins either, so it's kind of, it's going to be a little, you know, be the first thing for you guys tomorrow. But, what we want you guys to do tomorrow is, is, is we're there all day, okay? You're going to, you can put in, now obviously not everybody's going to have the fourth and fifth intercostal space, Anterior axillary line. We're going to be poking holes all over these cadavers. Be, there are three cadavers again, right? Three, three. We've always done three in the past. I assume it was three. Um, I'm not sure. I um, so obviously, you know, it, it's a. Uh, we're going to have to move around. But again, you're going to get what it feels like to make the incision, and to poke through the lungs, and all kind of stuff. But if you have questions, you don't understand anything tomorrow. Don't don't forget to ask. Okay. Next week. Tomorrow. 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 T